God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Amen. It's good to be with you. It's good to be with some of you for the first time in a while. We're, we're slowly filtering back in, and uh, I'm excited to see that. And I can't wait for the day where we're pretty much all here. I don't know if that ever happens. There's always someone that gets sick or someone that misses for whatever reason, but uh, we're getting close. And, uh, and I, I don't know, I, every week I just get progressively more blessed seeing you, and uh, it's just, it's good to be back. It's good to be back together. Uh, and we've got a year of us. Can we remember that? We, I know we took a few months and, and kind of weren't gathering in this space, but we've got a year of us. And I, I know, you know some of us are concerned at, at this point that, you know, the, the Yellowstone Super Volcano is going to like erupt in July or August. We're going to see Godzilla, or we're going to get to the end of, of December, and December 31st is going to somehow turn into December 32nd. I know we're all kind of like dreading things and maybe expecting that there's more to come, but we don't want to completely lose focus. Uh, of 2020 while we're here. So I, I want to draw our attention back to the series that we began uh, back in January uh, around our year verse. It was, it was intended to be a 12-part uh, series with one installment each month, but I, I decided to put that on hold uh, during our separation and go in a different direction, and we took uh, some time to look at the seven letters of Revelation. Uh, we've got a little, little bit of ground to make up because of that, so I'm going to start that this morning, and uh, actually we're going to be doing another one of these installments next week, and then I think we'll go into something else for a little while, but we're going to try to play some catch-up. Uh, now, I titled this series, uh, Recovering Our Blessing, 12 Things Christians Don't Do, uh, But Should, and, and it's it's been a while, so I, I want to give you a little bit of uh, commentary on that, especially since some of you might have missed the first couple of messages in this series, uh, or you forgot that we're doing this series, and so I want to uh, qualify that title just a little bit. This is not 12 things no Christian does. Uh, this is not 12 things nobody in this church does, uh, but I think there's a good chance that many of us aren't uh, doing at least some of the things that we're going to be looking at, at least not with the consistency and with the intentionality uh, that we should, despite the clarity of God's instructions. What that means is that we are not uh, receiving all of God's blessings in our lives. And so, so my aim, every time I engage with you in one of these messages, is to point you toward one more place where the Lord has promised us that we will find his blessing, because that's a place that we want to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. That is a place we want uh, our church to be, in the fullest blessing of the Lord. We want to live uh, as this book instructs us to live, because Jesus doesn't say in our year, verse John 13, 17, that if you know these things, you are blessed. But if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. So with the expectation that the Holy Spirit will enlighten the eyes of our hearts this morning, we're going to turn our attention to the Gospel of Luke. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and find your place with me. In Luke chapter 6, we're going to be picking up with verse 27. Uh, this is not an unfamiliar passage, but as we saw last week, sometimes being familiar with a passage means we need to be especially careful with it. So Luke chapter 6, beginning with verse 27. And as I always do, for those of you who haven't stood up yet, I want to ask you please stand with me in reverence to what God has spoken. This is the Word of God. These are the words of God given to the evangelist Luke by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and we ought to receive them as such. So here are the words of the living and the true God. This is Jesus speaking. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. 
and do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Grass withers, flower fades. The word of our God stands forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, we thank you for your word. How blessed we are to be able to gather like this again and, and to read it and to hear it. We ask that you would show us in these words spoken by your Son, inspired by your Spirit, these words, these living words, would you show us in them the path to blessing? Would you help us walk that path? Would you walk with us? Lord, please walk with me as I preach a word that I'm not even worthy to hold in my hands. I pray that you would grant me faithfulness. I pray, God, that you would sanctify your church and that you would do a work in us that will be lasting and glorifying to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, you. so the last uh, seven weeks in our look at the letters to the churches in Revelation, Jesus would always say, he who has an ear, let him hear and I just want to point out to you that as we begin, you're going to find that same sentiment in verse 27. I say to you, who hear. Now the implication in that is that not everyone's going to listen. Not everyone's going to listen. You're going to have those who do, but they don't do it. And by that I mean that there are people who will read these words. There are people who will hear these words and understand these words. There are people who will even praise these words. There are people who will teach these words to others, but they won't do what these words are telling them to do. And the Bible has a lot of warnings against that kind of hearing. There's Ezekiel 33, where the people treat the word of God like it's a song that's just meant to be listened to. There's James chapter 1 that says that if that's you, you're deluding yourself. There's Matthew chapter 7 where if that's you, Jesus says that that kind of hearing is both foolish and dangerous. And in every case, what you'll find is that the blessing only ever comes in the doing. It's only ever found in the doing. So we want to do more than hear this text. We want to do more than stand in reverence of this text, although that's good. We want to do more than, than go out and maybe sing a song that incorporates the lyrics of this text uh, in that song. We want to do more than memorize this text. We want to do, very simply, we want to do what this text is telling us to do. I heard a story about a man who'd reached his 100th birthday. And uh, as they tend to do in the news, they need their 60 seconds of feel good after their 20 minutes of everything in this world that's, that's bled and burned and broken in the last 24 hours. So they sought this guy out. He just turned 100, and they, they sent one of the reporters to go and give him an interview right from his porch. And, and you know, after asking him those, those standard questions that you ask someone who turned 100, what's your secret, and do you still drive? And uh, sometimes the answer to that first one is because of the answer to that second one. But after those kind of standard questions, uh, she asked him what he was most proud of. And without missing a beat, the guy said that I don't have an enemy in this world. And the reporter said, wow. And she's like, this is great. This is that piece we were looking for. So what a beautiful sentiment. That is inspirational. And the guy said, yep. He said, I outlived every one of them. <laughs> Church, that, that doesn't have to be our strategy when it comes to our enemies. We can do so much more than, than force a smile and mind our own business and kind of wait them out. You know, kind of uh, ignore them when they're around or avoid them so that we don't have to ignore them. Jesus is calling us to something higher than that. He's calling us to something greater than that. He's calling us to something that's rooted in that divine nature that he's inviting us to partake in, according to 2 Peter 1.4. It's something greater. But before we, we look at that, two quick things. First off, uh, I don't know who you see as your enemy. Maybe it's the boss uh, who makes you know, 9 to 5 the worst part of your day every day. Maybe it's the neighbor who makes your property line feel kind of like a battleground. Uh, 
Uh, maybe it's your ex whose unfaithfulness broke your heart and, and, and destroyed your ability to trust anybody else. Or, or maybe it's someone in your own family who sort of weaponized your, your children and your grandchildren and, and used them against you. And, and that thing that's supposed to be maybe one of the greatest sources of joy in your life has turned into the greatest struggle. Picture them right now. Don't let this live in some kind of ethereal philosophical place. I, I want you to right now in your mind see the face of your enemy. The person who's done you the most harm, the most damage, the most evil. The, the person who's caused you the most grief and the most stress and the most strife. Picture that person. You probably can think of someone. If you can't and you're under 100, it's either because you're unaware of who they are, because you do have enemies, <laughs> or it's because they're unaware of who you are, and I mean as a Christian, because Jesus said, woe to you when all men speak well of you. That's actually just one verse back from where we began this morning. It's verse 26. You know, the World Health Organization said just this week that asymptomatic spread of the coronavirus is very rare. I don't have a statistic on that. It would probably be a made-up number anyway, because I don't think they really know. But something else that you need to know is that asymptomatic Christianity uh, doesn't spread so much either. Of course, it also doesn't upset anybody, whereas if you're living any kind of sanctified life, if you're standing for the word of God in this world as the culture around you collapses in delusion and, and starts redefining right and wrong and, and digging its heels in against God, if you're doing that, you're going to be in opposition without even looking. Expect that to accelerate in the days ahead. I, actually, I think a lot of us are going to start relating more to David in Psalm 3, where he talks about, Lord, how my enemies have multiplied. So many have risen up against me. I think that's going to become probably one of our favorite psalms in the days ahead. We're going to really start resonating with that. Something to remember, uh, and I have said this before. I think I've actually said this a couple of times before, uh, but I think it's especially helpful in having the right perspective. And everything practical that Jesus is giving us here demands that we have the right perspective. That's where, it's, that's where it comes from. Uh, there are people who harbor bitterness toward us. There are people who hate us. There are people who even knowingly and purposefully seek to antagonize us, whether they're the liar or the cheater or the abuser or the accuser. But even though they would make themselves out to be our enemies, they are not the enemy, ultimately. The enemy is the enemy. Anyone you can think of, they're his captives and they don't even realize it. Our job isn't to defeat people, our job is to deliver people, to show them Jesus because he's the one. You remember the old song? He's the one that comes and sets the captives free. He opens prison doors and he sets the captives free. So we're not to fight against them, we're to fight for them. And Jesus is going to show us in this text three ways that we're to fight for them. And I want you to really ask yourself uh, as we're looking at this are you doing this? I know that you know this. I, I mean, are you actually doing what Jesus is saying here? Are you doing this for whoever it was you just pictured? And if you're not, how can you start doing this? Because there's a promise of blessing. And if you remember last week, Jesus is the amen to that promise. Jesus is the amen to every promise of God. And this is a promise of blessing. Verses 27 and 28 are going to give us our three. And then we're going to unpack those. And that's really going to be our focus this morning. I read sort of a larger portion of text. We are not going to be expounding everything here, all of these 12 verses. I, I really want our focus to be on the simple this morning, because sometimes the simple is a lot harder than we think. Look at what he says. Love your enemies. And then we've got three further commands, but they're really more of the how of the first command, right? How are we to love our enemies? And he gives us three things. Do good to those who hate you, and bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. We've heard those words before, right? You know Jesus is teaching, but again, are you living these words? Because agreeing with them in principle isn't the same as living them, right? Being willing uh, to apply them in some hypothetical situation, that isn't the same as actually living them. Loving our enemies, it's, it's so foreign and it's so backwards to the way our flesh operates. It's, it's contrary to fe what feels right. It's really contrary to what feels uh, normal. The world says to get even with your enemies, if you're able to. But if not, if you can't get even with them, well, then at least get away from them. But Jesus is calling us to something different. He's calling us to actively and counterintuitively be involved in the lives of our enemies and for their betterment. 
None of the words he's using in these instructions are given to us in some passive voice. Love, do good, bless, pray for. These are all describing deliberate actions. This is a love that extends itself. And this is, I think this is a challenging thing. I would argue that, that beyond even being a challenging thing, loving your enemies in the way that Jesus is describing here is a supernatural thing. It is a gospel-inspired thing. It is a God-enabled thing, and without his enabling, we can't do it. And he enables us to carry it out in three ways. First, do good to those who hate you. That seems so simple, but, but I actually think this might be one of the least followed of all of Jesus' commands. That's why I chose it for this series, and here's why. I think, I think most of us think we're doing well when we just don't hate those who hate us. Right? We'll, we'll say, well, I don't hold any grudges. I don't have anything against them. I don't wish him any harm, but that's, that's not enough with what Jesus is saying here. Here's the thing. As Christians, we're commanded to forego retribution. We're commanded to forfeit retaliation. We're commanded to forget about repayment. The, the scriptures say, vengeance is mine, I will repay. That's a, a divine declaration from Deuteronomy 32, and it's given to us again in Romans chapter 12, and it's given to us again in Hebrews chapter 10. But if you look at the context, that is speaking to reprisal, inflicting whatever sense of justice we think needs inflicted. And God never gets it wrong, so he gets the right away. But just because we can't react in wrath doesn't mean we don't respond at all. In fact, if we don't respond... We're really only following half of what he said. I'll show you. Look, look with me at Romans chapter 12. If you want to turn over there. This is one of the places we find that Old Testament quote in a New Testament light. Someone give me an amen when you find it. My pages are sticking, so you're probably going to beat me there. Amen. Right. Romans chapter 12. Look at verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. That's familiar. I think we just read that. We're actually going to go back to that next when we look back at Luke. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. This is a gold mine. I've been going to a lot of grad parties uh, the last couple of weeks, and, and I kind of wish I would have just written Romans 12 and all the guest books for like advice, Romans 12. I think that would have saved me a lot of writing, and it's probably the best advice you could give anybody. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Here we go. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. That's the prohibition. That's it. But he doesn't stop there. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, here's the quote from Deuteronomy, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. And here's the summary that shows where to go beyond that prohibition at verse 20, hasn't already made that clear. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the same kind of deliberate, intentional action or, or doing that the Lord commanded us back in, in Luke chapter 6 to have in our lives. And, and Paul shows us practically what that might look like. He gives us a few examples. And Jesus does the same thing. If you look back at Luke chapter 6, the, the lending he describes, the, uh, the giving beyond what even their demands are that he describes, the, the mercy that he describes. Here's the thing, he's done it. This is what I love the most about Jesus, when he tells us to do something. He's done it. We have a human example in Christ, and I think that's one of the most beautiful parts of the Incarnation. How did Jesus respond to his enemies? What about the crowds that grumbled at him? He fed them. He gave them beyond what they needed. Remember, they had leftovers, they had too much. What about Judas? You know, something we need to realize is that Jesus wasn't ignorant of who Judas was. 
When we were going through John's gospel last year, chapter 2 said that he didn't need anybody to testify about man because he himself knew what was in man. And before we start thinking that that's some generic statement about just kind of the, the sinful condition of mankind and that's not a specific statement about the condition of those around him, well, Matthew and Mark tell us that he knew people's thoughts and he knew people's hearts. So of all the 12 that Jesus might have uh, delegated to, I, I wonder, have you ever sat in question, why let Judas keep the money bag? Because John 12, 6 says that he used to take from it. Jesus knew that. There were 11 other disciples. One of them was a former tax collector, so I don't know. I think he would have been the obvious choice for kind of the, the one that's going to hang on to the money. He dealt with money. That's sort of what he did for a living. And yet Jesus gives it to Judas. Why give the bag to an embezzler? Why pick the thief of the 12? you got 12 guys in front of you. You need one to be your treasure. You're going to pick the one that steals. Why do that? Have you ever really thought about it? Because he knew what was in Judas's heart. He knew what Judas was thinking. And by the way, I don't recommend that you do that with your own personal finances. God's wise enough to work all that out by choosing a thief as his treasure. Us, not so much. That will not end as well. Uh, for us. But do you ever wonder why he did that? He knew that he was going to steal, but he let him hang on to the bag. He knew that he was going to betray him, too. John 6 tells us that, but then he still washes his feet when you get to John 13. And when he was turned over to the men who wanted him dead in Matthew 26 by Judas and by a kiss of all things, Jesus still calls him friend. He wasn't being ironic when he did it. Call him his friend. Look up Matthew 26. Right when he betrayed him. Friend, do what you've come to do. The world itself, which is full of corrupt, sinful people and continually refuses to follow after him, is the very same world Jesus came to reconcile and to redeem. Romans 5 8 says that God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And two verses later, it really brings the language, I think, to a greater symmetry because it tells us that when we were enemies, that's when Christ reconciled us. When we were his enemies. So who hates you? Who's disowned you? Who's disregarded you? And maybe like Paul said, as much as it's dependent on you, you've tried to be at peace, but everything you've said seems to be misunderstood or, or misinterpreted. <clears throat> Jesus is telling you to seek them out and intentionally do them good. Don't miss that, because I think we can feel like we're standing in a place of obedience when we simply refuse to retaliate. But there's a positive command to overcome evil with good. And that can only be done by acts of grace done for the ungracious. And acts of kindness done for the kind who don't deserve it. And that means going out of your way to do it. How far? How far are we to go out of our way to do it? Well, let me ask you this. How far out of his way was the cross from the throne of heaven? I don't think we have to go any further than that. Not one step further than that. When you realize, when you realize how far Jesus has come to do you good, you stop counting the steps that you're taking to do others good. Do you think he stopped coming? Do you think he's still not pursuing you? Every day. Bring this into the realm of real life. Make this as practical as you can make it this morning. What good can you do this week to the least suspecting, least deserving? Jesus says do it. Go and do that. By the way, there's a psychological and also a practical reality this has been proven that that repeated actions of good toward another person will often change attitudes toward good as well meaning that you'll probably even start liking them more just because of what you've invested in it's funny how that works we're to do good to those who hate us good through our actions that's the part we don't want to lose sight of good through our actions and the old saying that actions speak louder than words right that's the saying but as far as this command goes, both of them are talking at once. Our actions are talking, but our words are talking. So in that light, our love ought to be a loud love. Because Jesus says next, bless those who curse you. That means bless those who malign your character. Bless those who gossip about you. 
Bless those who lie about you and spread rumors about you and turn other people against you by their twisted narratives and their half-truths and everything else that comes out of their mouth. Bless those people. See, the natural tendency, that the habit of the heart that's uninhabited and unsanctified by the Spirit is to curse those who curse us and to do it in a more creative way, to one-up them. Proverbs calls that wood to the fire, and the reminder is there, too, that for lack of wood, the fire goes out. But again, Jesus isn't calling us to just hold back the firewood here and keep our criticisms from countering their criticisms. He's calling us to drown the fire with water, the living water that is inside of us, the living water that never runs dry. We are to be proactive in this. We are to be intentional in this, meaning that that, that old adage that if you can't say anything nice, you don't say anything at all, that applies to us, but it never leaves us speechless. It never leaves the Christian speechless because we always have something nice to say. We're commanded to bless our enemies. We're commanded to bless those who curse us. Think about that. Bless those who curse you mean we're to speak well of those who don't speak well of us, and it's, it's here, I think. And what are sometimes the most painful parts of our lives that the most glorious opportunities come to live like Jesus, who was cursed even by those that he died for. And before that, when he was feeding and when he was healing and ministering and befriending friendless sinners, he was called a glutton and a drunkard and a blasphemer and a madman, all without merit, all without cause. It was never true. Anything they said about him, it was never true. Which can't always be said about us. Because even though there's a thousand things we might be undeservingly called, there's more than a few that are true, even if they're not taxable. I think it was Spurgeon who said, if any man thinks ill of you, don't be angry with him. You're far worse than he thinks you to be. That one got me through almost a decade of retail banking. I used to tell myself <laughs> that you would pick up that phone, the things you would hear, and I thought you're worse than they're saying you are. I knew it. Now, whether or not their curses carry weight, really kind of irrelevant because their intention is to weigh you down, but just the same, Jesus says, lift them up. Bless those who curse you. See, you can't rejoice that your life hangs completely on the undeserved mercy of being blessed by Christ when you were his enemy, and then turn around and curse somebody else. You gotta bless them, because you've been blessed. By the way, sarcasm doesn't count. I just want to put that one by. Sarcasm does not count. That's important. Need to get there. Did you know that comes from the Greek phrase that means to eat flesh? I did not know that till this week. It means to eat flesh. So the picture is tearing someone to pieces with your mouth. That's what sarcasm means. It's kind of a kind of a word picture. Some of us, we speak it so fluently, we can put that on our resume and not be breaking a commandment that we lie because we're pretty good at it. But we shouldn't do that. First off, second off. When we substitute our sarcasm for the blessing that Jesus wants us to give someone, you're not only withholding your grace, but you're standing in the way of his grace that he intends to manifest through you. You bear his name, Christian. You carry his name with you. So we're to do good to those who hate us, to bless those who curse us, and finally we're to pray. For those who mistreat us, and I want to tell you that if you're struggling with the others, I would advise you to start here. I know that sequentially, this one is given to us last, but when it comes to these, I think apply that kingdom principle about the last being first, because I think this one is going to help you. It's going to enable you to do those other ones. This one works on your heart, maybe more than it works on theirs. I think he'll do both. We can become bitter toward people who mistreat us, but it's hard to be bitter toward people we're praying for. See, God's, he's wired us that way. He has so constructed our minds that we can really only have one thought at a time, and a prayerful thought is going to keep away the sinful thought. Sounds like a bumper sticker, but it's, it's true. It's very true. When you pray for people, when you're actively, daily praying for them, something changes. Something changes. It changes in them, I believe that. Because God honors prayer. But I believe it also changes in us. Praying for your enemies is one of the deepest forms of love you can have for them. Because you've got to really, really want something good for them if you're going to pray for them. You can say a lot of nice words. You can do a lot of nice things for your enemy and still lack genuine desire that things actually go well for them. But interceding for them in prayer in the presence of God who knows your heart 
is living on a higher level of love, I think. Maybe it's for their repentance, maybe it's for their conversion, maybe it's that, that God would show them the darkness of their hearts or snatch them from that road to ruin that their sin is dragging them down, or maybe it's just you praying that he would give them peace, even though that's the last thing that they want for you. Jesus did it from the cross. Even for the men that whipped him behind him and nailed him to it and mocked him beneath it, he said, Father, forgive them. Stephen did it. Acts chapter 7. As they stoned him in the same city that they slew his Savior, those rocks are rattling in his ears, and as he's being bruised by, by every blow, he prayed that God would spare them of his blood, and that prayer did not die in the air outside Jerusalem's gate. It passed all the way up through that pearl gate, and it reached the heart of God, and it obtained an answer. I promise you it did. Yeah. Jesus is calling us to have that same yeah. deepest sense of want on behalf of our enemies, that even if they came to us with stones in their hands, we would still seek for their good, that we would still seek God's best for them. And that means that even though sometimes you wince at the thought of being around them, you pray that you'll be around them forever in glory, and that God would even make that your highest aim for them. That though you cry for the coming of Christ and the glory of the kingdom and, and the end of every evil, when everything's going to be made new and everything's going to be set right, and you will no longer have an enemy, you remember the enemy that you have right now. You say, God, I want you to save them. They don't deserve it. But neither did I. What a difference it would make if instead of praying first for those closest to us, we, we began our prayers with those that we would rather keep farthest away. I want to challenge you to start doing that. Take those that maybe you prefer not to think about at all and start thinking of them first when you're standing before God. Reorder your, your prayers. Bring them to the front of the line. Living on a higher level of loving, and it, it's more than we're capable of apart from His grace, but we have His grace. I want to tell you something. When you do this, when you love like this through these means when you live in obedience to Jesus' words here, he's not so much asking you to imitate God's compassion. Don't get this wrong. <clears throat> he's not so much asking you to imitate God's compassion as much as he's asking you to be a channel for God's compassion. He has everything you could fold into this. Kindness, gentleness, peacefulness, self-control. What are those things? Where are those from? It's the fruit of the Spirit. That's God in you. Verses 35 and 36 tell us that loving our enemies, doing them good and, and giving freely, mercifully, generously, liberally, look at how it's described, even in the face of ungratefulness, makes us like our Father, and that in so doing, we're behaving as sons of our Father. So understand this. Really think about it this way. You're walking in victory in a thousand different tiny moments in your life. Makes you a reflection of don't you see that? We, we were made for that in the beginning, to bear his image. That was the reason he made us, to reflect him, to show how glorious he is to everything around us. That was the purpose for which we were made. We have a mysterious gift, church, beyond even that, as, as the redeemed of God, as those he has reconciled and revealed himself to in Jesus. We're finally being what we ought to be, and we're showing off his nature. You see, everyone in this world is made in the image of God, but every day by their actions and by their words and by their priorities and by their relationships, they're lying about who he is. They're image bearers, but they're lying about who he is because he is none of the things that they are. He's more and he's better. And Jesus is telling us in the simplest terms, in one of his most simple commands, tell them the truth. Show them the truth and pray that they might know the truth. Not everyone's going to hear this. Verse 27. But will you hear? More importantly, will you do it? Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate. 
hate you, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If you know these things, Jesus said, you are blessed if you do them. And God likewise added his blessing in the preaching of his word. Father, we thank you once again for your word. We ask that you would enable us by the spirit that inspired it, by the spirit that lives within us, to approach our enemies with the same grace that you came to us with when we were your enemies. And renew our commitment to doing it here today. And through that, may May they see you, and may they know you. May all who would curse us or, or hate us or use us receive the same precious salvation you gave us when we were no more deserving. Bless us as we go this morning to be a blessing to everyone around. reminder, we are going to be coming back together tonight at 6 o'clock. For anyone that can make it out, we just come together for about an hour of prayer from 6 to 7. If you can make it, come and, and pray with us. Bring your enemies list. We'll pray for every one of them if you want to start there. Uh, but come out, join us. You stand out for our benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Flushing Alliance Church, you are set. Go in peace.